Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this presentation, we'll be covering the fundamentals of muscle hypertrophy and how we can train for maximum muscle growth. First, we need to establish what muscle hypertrophy means. Simply put, muscle hypertrophy means growth of muscle. What is happening at a structural level is that the muscle fibers actually increase in size. Hypertrophy can occur in both parallel and in series. In parallel hypertrophy is when the muscle fibers grow in diameter, essentially making the muscle thicker. This is the most prevalent form of hypertrophy and what most people seek to achieve with their training. However, hypertrophy can also occur in series. This is when the muscle fiber grows in length, essentially making the muscle longer. This form of hypertrophy doesn't occur to as much of an extent as in parallel hypertrophy, but it can still be something that some athletes seek to achieve. This is mainly because in series hypertrophy has been shown to reduce injury risk in certain athletes. For example, an athlete who achieves in series hypertrophy of the hamstring muscles has been shown to be at a reduced risk of hamstring strain injury during sprinting. Furthermore, in series hypertrophy can help to increase mobility due to the muscles being structurally longer. For many athletes and trainees, this may be something that is sought. In series hypertrophy can be produced by loading muscles at long lengths. So exercises such as Romanian deadlifts, full range squats, full range chin ups, and chest flies would all be good options to induce in series hypertrophy in the relevant muscles. In series hypertrophy doesn't occur to the same extent as in parallel hypertrophy, and it may only be sought by individuals in very particular cases. The rest of this presentation will therefore focus on in parallel muscle hypertrophy. So how does muscle hypertrophy occur? Current evidence suggests that there are three mechanisms by which hypertrophy occurs. These are mechanical tension, muscle damage, and metabolic stress. To briefly summarize these mechanisms, mechanical tension is thought to be the primary driving factor behind muscle hypertrophy. It essentially refers to the muscle contracting under load and producing force during resistance training. Muscle damage refers to the micro injury that occurs to the microscopic contractile elements of the muscle and hypertrophy occurring from the swelling and repair of these cells. And lastly, metabolic stress refers to the accumulation of byproducts in the muscle that result from anaerobic energy production. We can explore these mechanisms in extreme depth, but it probably doesn't actually matter too much from a practical standpoint it is more important to understand what training will achieve hypertrophy. In reality, when we perform progressive overloading resistance training, these mechanisms will occur and hypertrophy will be achieved. So the question becomes, what type of training best induces muscle hypertrophy? While there is not one best way to train for hypertrophy, there are certainly considerations to abide by. And these considerations can be practically implemented in many different ways. First, we need to explore how to best apply progressive overload. Second, what repetition ranges should be employed. And lastly, what exercises should we select? Progressive overload is fundamental to progress in any form of training, and hypertrophy training is not an exception. However, there are many ways to progress training over time, and overload needs to be specific to the goal. It is quite clear from both research and anecdotal evidence that a progression in volume load is the key driver of hypertrophy. This means that we want to be doing one or more of the following progressions over time. The first is to increase reps while maintaining the number of sets and the load lifted. For example, going from three sets of 10 at 50 kilos to three sets of 12 at 50 kilos. The second is to increase load while maintaining the number of reps and sets. For example, going from three sets of 10 at 50 kilos 
to three sets of 10 at 55 kilos. Or we could increase the number of sets while maintaining the reps and load. For example, we could progress from three sets of 10 at 50 kilos to four sets of 10 at 50 kilos. All of these methods will increase the total amount of volume load produced by the muscle groups, thereby increasing our total mechanical tension and providing a driving stimulus for muscle hypertrophy. The repetition ranges used for a given exercise will vary based on numerous factors, but a rule of thumb is to stay between the 6 to 20 rep range as a guide. Repetitions of less than 6 will mean that many sets will be required to achieve the adequate tension and metabolic stress required for hypertrophy, which will generally tax the joints and the nervous system before an adequate muscle hypertrophy stimulus can be achieved. Repetitions of greater than 20 can still be used to great effect, although these need to be taken to or very close to failure to provide the necessary stimulus. This is time consuming and may not be practically appropriate for many trainees. However, it still may be a viable method for some individuals. So where on the 6 to 20 repetition range spectrum we choose will be based on the following factors. First, we need to consider if the exercise is more compound or more isolated. Compound lifts are generally better suited to lower rep ranges, while isolation exercises will generally be better suited to higher rep ranges. For example, a deep back squat may be better suited to the 6 to 10 rep range, while leg extensions may be better suited to the 10 to 15 rep range. We also need to consider how much range of motion does the exercise involve, and does it put the muscle in a highly stretched position? Generally, the larger the range of motion and more stretch it is placed under, the more quickly it will fatigue, so lower repetitions generally suit larger ranges of motion, and higher repetitions generally suit shorter ranges of motion. For example, a Romanian deadlift will be better suited to the 6 to 10 rep range, while a hamstring curl may be better suited to the 8 to 15 rep range. How do the individual's joints handle the loading? For example, if a trainee has a history of shoulder pain, it may be best to use lighter loads with higher repetitions on any shoulder exercises. If a joint has never experienced any issues, then lower reps may be permitted. And lastly, individual preference plays a role in which rep ranges to select. Some people generally feel that they get more of a stimulus from higher reps, and some prefer lower reps. This may have something to do with muscle fiber types from both a genetic standpoint and their training history. Another important consideration for hypertrophy training is what exercises to select. There are no best exercises, but once again, there are principles to help us make better exercise choices. First and foremost, we want to select exercises that cover every movement for maximum muscle stimulation. The primary movements are vertical pushing, horizontal pushing, vertical pulling, horizontal pulling, squatting or lunging, and a hip hinge. Performing all of these movements will use essentially all of the muscle groups in your body, and accessory exercises can then be employed for additional emphases on certain muscles. Once again, we want to consider if we select compound or isolation exercises to maximize muscle hypertrophy. Generally speaking, as mentioned, the compound lifts will establish a foundation of muscle, and isolation exercises can be used to emphasize certain muscle groups. For example, after doing rows and pull downs for a back workout, Additional bicep work could be performed since the biceps aren't taxed extensively during pulling movements. For the most part, compound exercises should make up the majority of hypertrophy training since they are simply more effective than isolation exercises. Greater range of motion almost always results in greater muscle hypertrophy. Therefore, there is not much to be said other than to always use full range of motion for all resistance training exercises when the goal is muscle hypertrophy. 
the only reason not to use full range of motion would be due to an injury or having pain during a certain exercise. This leads on to the next point, and that is about joint health. Similar to when we discuss the repetition ranges for hypertrophy, joint health may also influence exercise selection. Certain exercises can sometimes irritate the working joints for different individuals. For example, many people claim that the shoulder joint is taxed from any form of bench pressing, but dips and push-ups cause no issues at all. This may be due to injury history, pain thresholds, or simply the individual anatomy of the trainee. Furthermore, the individual anatomy of a trainee may influence which exercises are selected beyond joint health. Certain movements can be biomechanically better or worse suited to different individuals. If a trainee cannot comfortably and confidently perform a certain exercise, they may wish to select a different movement targeting the same muscle groups. A classic example of this would be squats for people with long versus short legs. Generally, people with shorter femurs will find squats comfortable to perform, while their long-legged counterparts may need a long time just to be able to perform the movement adequately. So maybe a leg press would be a better option for a longer-legged person rather than squats. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.